Anybody and God does not choose everybody. He chooses some people and rejects some people. We don't serve a capricious God. We serve a God of logic, of intelligence, and of knowledge. There is something definite that God looks for when He's looking for a leader. When God comes and He wants to empower you to prosper, there is something He's looking for. He doesn't just come to empower you because you came for IGOC. He empowers you because there is something specific he's looking for and you qualify for that. Mensah Odebill, teacher, philanthropist, motivator. IGOC 2009. Please welcome your speaker, Dr. Mensah Odebill. Loaded. Loaded. Today I'm talking on a topic that is very simple. It's simply stretch. I'm talking on stretching. Tell somebody next to you, get ready to stretch. 
I'll tell another person, get ready for some stretching. Amen. God wants to stretch you. He wants to stretch your faith. And he wants to stretch your capacity. You cannot receive what you don't have the capacity to absorb. And so if God wants to pour much into you, he's going to first stretch your capacity. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Eternal Father, tonight we submit ourselves to you. We submit our wills to you that you will work in us, that you will condition our minds, that you will help our thought processes to be aligned with your purposes. We pray, Lord, that you grant us the courage to do what we know is right. Give us the hearing ear. Give us the listening, understanding heart, Lord, that we may not only be hearers, but do us of your word also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stretching involves the process of pulling or pushing something in order for the thing to achieve growth and increase. So for there to be growth and increase, God has to push and God has to pull you in different directions so that you can respond to what he has for you. You cannot step up without stretching. If you go from one stair to the other or from one rung of a ladder to the next, you have to stretch one foot over the other. So stretching is a process. And for you to step up, you're going to need stretching. You cannot take what is offered you without stretching. If God has something for you, he places it within your reach, not in your hands. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That simply means it's close enough for you, but you have to do something to appropriate it. You can't take what is offered until you do some stretching. The women will tell you, you cannot give birth until there has been some stretching, very uncomfortable. And you cannot grow until there has been some stretching. So these processes that I've mentioned all require that we stretch in one way or the other. I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah chapter 54. And I'm going to read from verses 1 to verse number 3. Isaiah chapter 54 verses 1 to 3. Isaiah is in the New Testament, in the Old Testament of your Bible. It's just before Jeremiah, if you know where Jeremiah is. This passage we're about to read is a prophetic word that Isaiah gave to Israel. And he gave it to Israel at a very difficult moment in the history of the nation. The nation is going through crisis. There is despondency. People are tired. People are weary. People are fearful. People feel defeated. People feel like they are failures. And they feel like everything or the bottom has fallen out and everything is not working. In the midst of such despondency, the prophet Isaiah comes with the word of God to the children of Israel. And these are the words that he speaks to them. He says, sing, O bearing, you who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud for you, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman says the Lord enlarge the place of your tent and stretch and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings do not spare lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes for you shall expand to the right and to the left and your descendants will inherit the nations 
and make the desolate cities inhabited. This is a powerful prophetic word to a people who feel very depressed. I like how the Message Bible renders the verse 2. This is how the Message Bible renders verse 2. It says, clear lots of ground for your tents. Make your tents large. Spread out. Think big. Use plenty of rope. Drive the tent pegs deep. The part that I like most in this rendition is the part that says, think big. This is what God is saying to Isaiah, to Israel through Isaiah. There are two groups of people that Isaiah is primarily addressing. The first group of people, he addresses them and calls them the barren. He says to the barren that they will bring forth into singing and shout. Basically, when the Bible refers to a barren person in this context, it's talking about a person who is unable to bear fruit. And it's not just talking about women who cannot have children. Because he's talking to a nation. And there are children in the nation, and there are men in the nation, and there are women in the nation, and there are people who have physical children in the nation, but he addresses all of them as barren. So this kind of barrenness is not just barrenness in terms of the fruit of the womb, but barrenness in terms of lack of productivity. The whole nation is not producing. They are in crisis. There are enemies around, and they are afraid to venture out to do anything great for God. And that creates barrenness. The second group of people that Isaiah addresses are the desolate the desolate refers to those who are alone and forsaken, those who have nobody to help them, those who are abandoned, those who are neglected. And he addresses the whole nation as a desolate nation, a nation where nobody seems to have help to be able to achieve any set objective. And he says to those who are desolate, they're going to have plenty and they're going to have abundance. The picture that God paints for Israel in this context is a very positive one, although the condition of the people is in stark contrast to the message that Isaiah is giving. And Isaiah gives them a word that is clearly designed to cause them to rise up, to do something extraordinary for God. He says to them, enlarge the place of your tent. This is a passage that most of us are familiar with. I actually had preached from this passage before. I have a message from the same passage that I titled, Enlarge Your Tents. And I preached it several years ago. People were blessed. Then I read the passage again last year. As I was going through, I read the Bible many times, so I was reading it again, and I realized God did not say, enlarge your tents. I said, so why did I preach God said, enlarge your tents? He didn't say, enlarge your tents. He said, enlarge the place of your tents. The place of your tent is not the same as your tent. So what God was telling them to enlarge was not the physical structure called the tent, but the place where they had put the tent. Because if you are unable to enlarge the place where you have put your structure, you cannot enlarge the structure. So what God is saying is, before you think about structural change, you have to do more fundamental changes the place where you have chosen to place the stand is where the problem is. If the place is limited and you have a great vision, you're still going to have a small tent. Because the place of the tent is small. The tragedy for many people is they have great vision, great ambition. They come to gathering of champions and hear words that make, seek to make them champions. And they want to build big things. But the place is small. 
And so they try to do big things in a small place, and there is a contradiction. They get frustrated, and then they finally end up saying, it doesn't work. Well, it works if you start getting it right from the beginning. So God said, don't enlarge the tent, enlarge the place of your tent. Everybody say after me, enlarge the place. Amen. So what does the place refer to? The place, what does it refer to? The place refers fundamentally to the premise. The premise. The premise is the place, is the environment that you create in order to build something on. And a premise simply means the belief or basis on which you live and act. Enlarge the place of your tent. Enlarge the premise on which you have built. Somebody say, how does that work out? Well, each one of us do what we do because of a premise. The premise is the fundamental belief that made you do what you're doing. So when you see people doing what they're doing, you cannot change what they are doing until you can understand the premise on which they stood to build what they have built. So, for example, if a young man wants to marry, and the premise for wanting to marry is because he watched a nice movie, and he saw two people in love, and they were in so much in love and, and they loved each other and they had fun with each other and, and they chatted and, and they cared for each other and the movie ended very nicely. Just at the time the movie was ending, he had a revelation in his heart. So he has a premise. Right after that movie, or maybe somebody talks to him about marriage, or he sees a couple who are doing so well, or he sees a beautiful girl, he says, oh, I just want to have fun. Oh, life can be beautiful. Life is fun. So he decides, I'm going to marry. And what is the premise for the marriage? Fun. Marriage has to be fun. It has to be cool. We must get along. It's just beautiful. That's the premise. And so he meets this lady. That's the tent. <laughs> now he's going to take that tent and put it on the premise. So he builds and he thinks, well, I've got my tent. That's my premise. Life is nice. It's cool. It's beautiful. And that's my nice tent. Sister Lucy. <laughs> Lucy the tent. Then they get on and uh, all of a sudden things start working. And uh, problems come in, and there are difficulties, and, and Lucy is not fitting on the premise the way it was designed for it to fit. Lucy wants more, Lucy gets upset, Lucy gets emotional, and then she gets pregnant, and she's crying without provocation, and there's no fun. And all of a sudden, brother comes and says, Ah, I'm fed up. I want a change. And eventually he's demanding a divorce. Why is he demanding a divorce? The tent is the same. It's the same Lucy. The problem is not Lucy. The problem is the premise. The foundation, the basis on which he constructed his marriage. And if he doesn't change that premise, he's going to marry another person on the same premise and he's going to fail. Because the problem is the premise, is the foundation, the, the basis on which you have constructed what you have constructed. And it's not only in relation to marriage, it's in relation to every, everything. Money. Life. The premise. The premise is defined by two things. The first is location, where you place yourself. And the second is dimension, the space you operate in. If the dimensions are small, 
You cannot build a huge auditorium on a small piece of land. If you have a hundred square feet, or let me be generous, a hundred square meters of land, and you want to build a thousand seater auditorium on hundred square feet or meters of land, I know you are a man of faith, and I know you believe with God all things are possible. But may I just suggest to you, Mr. Faith, that your vision is too big for your premise. So if you want to have that big vision, then you have to enlarge your premise. Until you can change the place of your tent, you cannot do anything about your tent. So God comes to Israel and he says, the problem you are having, the reason you are barren, the reason you are desolate, it's not because there is a curse on you. The reason you are desolate and the reason you are barren is simply because you have constructed your reconstruction. Because this is the return group, the reconstruction group. He says, you built this whole enterprise on a narrow, limited, confined idea. And I cannot bless you because your mindset is too little for a big blessing to enter into it. Turn to somebody and tell them, get ready to stretch. And tell them, the problem is not your tent. It's the place of your tent. Because the tent, what is the tent? The tent is a structure. Is a structure. A structure is basically an object built according to plan. The plan is on the premise. The tent is on top of the premise. If the plan or the basis is wrong, the structure cannot be right. The tent also refers to a system. A system. A system is a mechanism that gets things done. So therefore, the structure of your life is defined by the premise it is built on. The structure of your life is defined by the premise it is built on. It's amazing the premise on which people build their lives. Not too long ago, we wanted to, we went to acquire land to build our university. We went to a village which had the land and we're going to buy 250 acres of land to build a university. We asked the owners of the land, a poor village, with just a few people, probably population of about three, 350 people in the village. Lots of school going people who have no education roaming about, young people have no work to do. We went to them and we said, we want to buy this piece of land and how much does it cost? They value the land, told us the price for the land. And we said, fine, we will pay you what you have asked for. But can we make a suggestion to you that based on the value you have quoted to us, we will pay you half of that amount and convert the other half into a statutory, permanent, lifetime endowment scholarship for your village. So that every year, out of your village, four young people who qualify for university education will be given free university education in our university. And we threw that challenge to them. In my mind, I thought, this is a small village. Seriously, if they take up on this offer, they're going to be per capita the most intellectual community in Ghana because everybody 
of school going age who does well at the secondary school will have free university education for any course. Art, science, whatever they want to study. The elders of the village deliberated on it and gave us a response. And they said, no. They said, we want all the money now. And then this is what they added. They said, when our children grow up, they must learn to look for money themselves. So if you go to look at that village and it's poor, it's not poor because poverty found it. It's poor because the whole mindset is premised on a philosophy that undermines long-term generational thinking. And so, no matter how much economic aid you give to them, there will be no improvement in that village because the premise is limited. The problem of poverty, my friends, is not just a lack of resources or money, but a mindset of limitation that sabotages future potential. going to marry because I'm going to have twins. I'm going to have 10 children. Oh, by this time I have 15 children. Then they go through marriage and they have problem with having children. They want to dissolve the marriage. Why? Because the premise was not love for the person. She was going to marry a baby manufacturer. And if the factory refuses to produce, then the contract cannot work because the premise was a factory. Anytime you oppress any group of people, they will eventually rebel. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they can't read. I don't care whether they came, where they came from, whether they're male, female, black, white, fat, skinny, short, ugly, or cute. If you oppress them long enough, any human being will fight back because we were not meant to be enslaved by anybody. We were meant to be created in his image and in his splendor. Chicago, 80s, come on, say giant. The bigger, the harder, giants. All you gotta do is just sopranos. out there. Your words are praise. Put your hands together. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Right here. When you pray. 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 Open up your mouth and praise it. Hey. When you worship. I say worship. When you worship. Get yourself a worship life. When you worship, I say worship.
HEFC database. Searching speaker profiles. Match found. Match found. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I didn't come from the good side of town. I came all the way from Dallas, Texas to tell you something is about to happen in your life. Your conditions are lying on you and God will raise you up. I don't care how low you fell. If you trust him, he will bring you up. Somebody say, bring me up. T.D. Jakes, pioneer, humanitarian, best-selling author, IGOC 2009. It's time to step up. Please welcome Bishop T.D. Jakes. We're going to read the Gospel of St. John first, and uh, then we're going to go to Exodus. It is my custom to stand for the reading of the word. Would you indulge me tonight by standing? It keeps people from falling asleep on me while I'm preaching. John chapter 14, verse 1 through 6. When you have it, say amen. Amen. It says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way, ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, how can we know the way? Hmm. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. Somebody say, he is the way. The The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Look at verse 4. And whether I go, ye know. And whether I go, ye know. And the way, the way, ye know. Then he saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. How can we know the way? And if you're one of those people that marks in your Bible like I do, underline the way every time you see it. And whether I go, ye know the way, ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Then Jesus says, I am the way. Somebody say, he is the way. Go quickly to the book of Exodus. And hopefully you will be able to follow my trend of thought as I go into the 14th chapter of the book of Exodus beginning at verse 21. When you have it, say amen. Amen. Here we have an Old Testament rendering of Moses' assignment, the purpose of the man of God who has been sent on a mission to totally eradicate the state and standing of the children of Israel who have gone into a very oppressive situation and out of the strength of their oppression they cried out to God. Sometimes you don't really pray till you get in real trouble but when things are really stacked against you you pray in another dimension and another level and they cried unto God and God said I have heard the cry of my people Go down, Moses, and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. In verse 21, we begin to see the first stages of a deliverance that occurred in their life. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a, were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. 
And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and, uh, and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. How many of you would like to have the Lord fight for you? Oh, glory to God. And the Lord said unto him, Moses, stretch out thine hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea and the sea returned to his strength. When the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. I don't know who this is for, but look at somebody and say, not one of your enemies will escape. No, not one of them. Not one. Not one. Not one. Don't worry. Don't sweat. Don't be intimidated. Don't be afraid. Don't be uneasy. Don't be upset. Don't sit up at night. Rest in the fact that the battle is not yours. It belongs to God. And not one of the enemies that you see today will you see again. Oh, somebody ought to shout hallelujah. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians dead, dead upon the seashore. They were dead on the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord, and his servant Moses. Can you say amen? amen? Now, I serve a God that can hear us when we whisper. In fact, I serve a God who can hear you when you think. The Bible said that Sarah laughed within herself and God heard her. The Bible said God knows your thoughts are far off, so we don't have to yell at God for God to hear us. And yet tonight, I'm getting ready to have you shout as if God were hard of hearing because I believe that there is going to be a great deliverance in this place. I said, I believe there is going to be a great mammoth, phenomenal, life-changing, thirst-quenching, mind-renewing deliverance in this place. Somebody shout, God! Ah, uh, that was pretty good. I want you to open up your mouth and holler like you're shouting at the children when they get on your nerves. Do it one more time. Shout, God! God! Make a way! Make a way! Oh, you just ask him to do what he does best. If there isn't a way, if you don't see a way, if the way is jammed up, if it's clogged, if you feel trapped, if you feel incarcerated, if you feel incapacitated, if you've done everything that you know how to do and you still can't get out and you see no way, we have a creative God who can create a way where there is no way. Do you hear what I'm saying tonight? Shout it one more time. God, make a way. Hallelujah. Let's pray while we're standing. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I approach thy throne with humility, understanding that you are God and you have no competitors. There's never been a God before you and there'll never be a God after you. You alone are God and we honor you in this place. We are the sheep of your pasture. We enter into your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. I pray God that you would give the kind of word tonight that answers somebody's question somebody has asked you a question on their knees speak in this place tonight I bind every devil I bind every foul spirit I bind every work of iniquity Holy Spirit take over this place tonight 
throw your weight around show the devil who's boss I thank you in advance for what you're about to do have your way in Jesus name shout amen, amen. glory to God you may be seated in his presence glory <laughs> God make a way he is a creative God. He is the creator. We are created in his likeness and in his image. That is to say that we are creative because we are created by a God who is the creator. And many times you must begin to recognize then that God has a sovereign and an invincible way of bringing things to pass in our lives. I want to preface my remarks uh, to the Gospel of St. John chapter 14. There is a great quandary that the apostles have found themselves in because they were walking with Jesus expecting him to set up his kingdom on earth as they had thought that he would but they did not recognize that there would be a cross and a process for him to undergo they are dealing with the weaning process that God often takes us through from faith to faith from glory to glory from one level of walking with him to the next level of walking with him he is trying to get them to understand I am stepping up the game I'm taking it to the next level and in order to take it to the next level, I have to wean you from where you've been so I can take you to where you're going. Any mother who's ever weaned a child will tell you that that is not an easy process. It is often difficult for the child to accept nourishment in a new way. Similarly, God's children often become hooked to what God did yesterday not understanding that today he desires to do a new thing in you. And if he is going to do a new thing in you, you have to have the faith to let go of the old thing that he did and release him to do a new thing in your life. Weaning a baby is often difficult because the baby refuses initially to accept food in a new methodology. And God has to wean us. Much like Samuel's mother had to wean him before he could go into the temple to be used of the Lord, there is a weaning process. It does not mean that God is not still a provider. It does not mean that God is not still a way maker. But it does mean that you can get hooked on how he did it before and not recognize him coming at you in a new and fresh way. A careful look at the life of the disciples will reveal that they always had trouble recognizing Jesus when he showed up in another way. You will remember when the storm broke out that night and the disciples were floating in the boat in the midst of the storm and Jesus, the answer, the way, was coming toward them but they thought he was a ghost because they did not see him or perceive him clearly in the storm. It is that same type of confusion we feel in the Gospel of St. John chapter 14. They are whining and upset because they do not understand the change that is taking place. Somebody say change. One of the hardest things to implement with a group of people, with a family, with a person, with a business, with a company, it doesn't matter what it is, the most difficult thing to institute is change. The concept in commercialism that we would use is called a paradigm shift, where not only are you changing your methodology, but the entire mentality has to be changed in order to go into the next era. It's not just giving the building a facelift and a fresh coat of paint, but it is a changing of how and what and why and when and where we do what we do. In a corporate sense, you often have to let some people go because some people are so in love with how they did things that they lack the flexibility to move into a new dimension. They don't have the liquidity of thought or the nimbleness of mind to be able to go from one era to the next. 
But how many know that if you're going to walk with God, you've got to be flexible? You've got to be mobile. And many, many times we become bound because we associate ourselves with people that are immobile and inflexible. And we have to make the decision. Do you want the commendation of the people that you're surrounded with more than the presence of God? Or are you willing to let go of where you've been so that you are released to go where God would have you to go? My brothers and sisters tonight, we live in a destination-oriented society. When I got ready to fly to London, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the Dallas airport. All of them were moving from place to place, up and down the various wings and corridors of the airport. And they were choosing where they were going to rest and wait based on destination. People are excited about destination. They advertise destinations for vacations, for cruises, for ventures. They advertise destinations. We are a destination-oriented society. But the reality is we cannot become so hooked on the destination that we don't realize that with God, it is not always so much about the destination as it is the things that happen along the way. You will learn more about God in process to becoming what he would have you to be than you do in the fulfillment of that process. He is forever a teacher. And in order to teach you, sometimes God will take you through a process. You signed up for the destination, but God takes you through a process because in the process of becoming what he would have you to be, you learn some things about God that you would not learn anyway. Somebody say process. That's, that's what people don't want to go through. They don't want to go through process. We want everything now. We want it quick. We want it fast. We want to get to the destination in a hurry. We want to get dinner done in a hurry. We want to get to the meeting quickly. But God is a God that says, walk thou before me. And in the process of walking with him, it is not just reaching the goal that is important. It is all the things that we learn about him while we are along the way. Now Jesus says, no man cometh unto the Father, save he come by me. The Father is the destination. And Thomas says, how can we know the way? How can we get to the destination? How can we get to where we're going? And Jesus says, I am the way. No man cometh unto the Father, save he come by me. In other words, when you walk with me, I'm going to bring you into your destination and your purpose. Now, if we were just teaching tonight, you would understand that you must first realize where you are, secondly realize where you're going, and how do I bridge the gap between where I am and where I'm going? The things I'm about to share tonight will not help people that have no vision because people who have no vision do not have a point of destination. They get up every morning and they go about their business and they lay down every night without any purpose, without any goal. They just take it however it comes. But when I got ready to speak here tonight, the Lord said to me that that would not be the kind of people that I would speak to tonight. He said that there would be people in this house that have a clear vision and a definite destination and a pure hope that you're not wandering through life. You know who you are, you know where you are, and you know where you want to go. Am I right about it? It is to those people that I want to speak tonight. I'm going to marry because I'm going to have twins. I'm going to have 10 children. Oh, by this time I have 15 children. Then they go through marriage and they have problem with having children. They want to dissolve the marriage. Why? Because the premise was not love for the person. She was going to marry a baby manufacturer. And if the factory refuses to produce, then the contract cannot work because the premise was a factory. Anytime you oppress any group of people, they will eventually rebel. I don't care who they are. I don't care if they can't read. I don't care whether they came, where they came from, whether they're male, female, black, white, fat, skinny, short, ugly, or cute. 
if you oppress them long enough any human being will fight back because we were not meant to be enslaved by anybody we were meant to be created in his image and in his splendor